What's up, YouTube? Ryan here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode I'm always contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And on this Monday in the fourth week of Lent, we have come in our following of Jesus through the Gospel of Mark. We have come into Holy Week. And for the next two weeks, this Gospel is going to slow down a little bit. So we're in chapter 12. We've got a great quote from a well, maybe less lesser known church father from the 17th century, and of course our ongoing catechesis, this time talking about the sacrament of holy baptism. Stick around. <laughs> So as this is a, a Monday through Friday thing, of course, there are Saturday and Sunday readings as well. And of course, way more than just this, there's also Old Testament readings and suggested hymns for the day. And of course, all of these can be compiled into matins or vespers or, or uh, other uh, prayer offices throughout the day that maybe today we find ourselves doing a little bit more often. Uh, but we're picking up in Mark chapter 12, and we're going to get kind of a not weird, but uh, another harsh teaching out of Jesus. Uh, and uh, the, the message is, is quite clear, although readily missed by those who heard it. Uh, so let's pick up. We're in Mark chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. And he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again he sent to them another servant, and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and him they killed. And so with many others, some they beat, and some they killed. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? Will he come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to, uh, vineyard to others? Have you not read the scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. Interesting, I think. Um, well, this is a parable, um, and certainly we don't want to see in this that God created us uh, and then walked off. Um, but it does speak of a separation, though, doesn't it? That the, the, the maker of the vineyard is separated. There's a separation there. And, of course, we've done that uh, by our sin. And, of course, all of the prophets that God had sent, uh, um, and that they knew. That the, the people Jesus was speaking to knew that he was talking about them. Uh, and they perceived that he was talking about all of the prophets and the, the fickleness of the people of God throughout the Old Testament. What I find interesting Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. Well, they did, uh, and the inheritance is ours. Um, <laughs> it's kind of a, an interesting uh, uh, twist of fate. And Jesus asks, what will the owner of the vineyard do? Will he come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others? This is twofold. Um, God certainly doesn't. Uh, in that, yes, we did kill the unique Son of God, uh, but by that, uh, he has made the inheritance ours. That was his plan all along. Uh, so no, uh, he's not uh, going to, but at the same time, he is. Because like you and me, right? We're Gentiles. And we're outside of that people of God. And so this is what Jesus is saying here. John's gospel says it best. He came to his own and his own did not recognize him. So Jesus, at the same time, he prays for mercy for those who killed him. He came to save those who would kill him. He also, yes, does give the vineyard to others, to all now. And this is good news. So we get into our writing uh, from John Bunyan. This is a 17th century uh, 
uh, saint of God, most prominently known uh, for his work, The Pilgrim's Progress, uh, kind of a, a fantastic rebuttal to the, the Pilgrim's Regress. Uh, so let's get to uh, this 17th century Christian here. I find to this day seven abominations in my heart. One, an inclination to unbelief. Two, suddenly forgetting the love and mercy that Christ shows us. Three, leaning to the works of the law. Four, wanderings and coldness in prayer. Five, forgetting to watch for that which I have prayed for. Six, a tendency to murmur because I have no more, and yet a willingness to abuse what I have. Seven, I can do none of those things which God commands me, but my corruptions will thrust themselves upon me so that when I would do good, evil is present with me. These things I continually see and feel and am afflicted and oppressed with, yet the wisdom of God orders them for my good. One, they make me abhor myself. Two, they keep me from trusting my heart. Three, they convince me of, this insuff of the insufficiency of all inherent righteousness. Four, they show me the necessity of flying to Jesus. Five, they press me to pray to God. Six, they show me the need I have to watch and be sober. Seven, and they provoke me to look to God through Christ to help me and carry me through this world. Amen. John Bunyan. Fascinating, uh, honest look at, at the human condition and how even these terrible things God can use for our good. Just like out of our reading from today, this evil inclination of man's heart God used for the good of those who, who sought to destroy him. It was in that death that he submitted himself to that he chose for himself, that he gave up of his own life. They didn't take it from him. He gave it up. And it's in that that he worked our greatest good. Now, our Lenten catechesis uh, picks up with uh, baptism. We've gone over the Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer, and now we're in baptism from both the large and small catechisms of Martin Luther. Every Christian also ought to have at least an ordinary brief instruction on the sacraments because without them he cannot be a Christian. Unfortunately, up to now, no instruction about them has been given, but in the first place, we take up baptism, by which we are first received into the Christian church. John 3, 5. Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28, 19. Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Mark, Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Mark 16:16. 16, 16. Here, in the words of Matthew 28:19 and Mark 16:16, 16, 16, stand God's commandment an inst institution. Let us not doubt that baptism is divine. It is not made up or invented by people. Baptism is no human plaything, but it is instruct instituted by God himself. Furthermore, baptism is most solemnly and strictly commanded so that we must be baptized or we cannot be saved. It is of the greatest importance that we value baptism as excellent, glorious, and exalted. We contend and fight for baptism chiefly because the world is now so full of sex arguing that baptism is an outward thing and that outward things are of no benefit. Let bap but let baptism be a thoroughly outward thing. Here stand God's word and command, which institute, establish, and confirm baptism. What God institutes and commands cannot be an empty thing. It must be a most precious thing, even though it looked like it had less value than a straw. To be baptized in God's name is to be baptized not by men, but by God himself. Therefore, although it is performed by human hands, it is still truly God's own work. From this fact, everyone may readily conclude that baptism is a far higher work than any work performed by a man or a saint. For what work can we do that is greater than God's work? 
From this, now learn a proper understanding of the subject and how to answer the question of what baptism is. It is not merely ordinary water, but water comprehended in God's word and command and sanctified by them. Ephesians 5, 26 through 27. So it is nothing other than a divine water. Not that the water in itself is nobler than other water, but that God's word and command are added to it. It's interesting, isn't it, that Martin Luther in the 16th century talked about people who were saying, oh, baptism is just an outward sign. <laughs> That's where that teaching comes from, Protestants, an outward sign of an inward reality. It's only as recent as the 16th century. A baptism is a work, but it's God's work in us, and thanks be to God for it, uh, because as Jesus said last week uh, to the answer, who can be saved, uh, with man it is impossible, with God all things are possible. So baptism being God's impossible, possible work. <laughs> we pray. Almighty God, you exalted your Son to the place of all honor and authority. Enlighten our minds by your Holy Spirit that, confessing Jesus as Lord, we may be led into all truth. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.